All right. Are we uh, up and running? Yes. All right. So uh, this is uh, our presentation on domestic violence survivors' rights to change their locks. Uh, my name is Shinyi Zhang. I am the staff attorney at HERA, the Housing and Economic Rights Advocates. Um, and this is our topic for today, um, the right for DV survivors to change their locks. We're going to be covering a variety of points uh, involved in this topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about the law of California that governs this topic. We're going to be talking about um, the specific steps that you need to take to go ahead and enforce uh, your right to change your lock. We're going to be talking also about other issues that aren't quite involving domestic violence, but we get a lot of questions here at HERA involving uh, such as landlord harassment and whether or not the tenant has the ability to uh, stop entry by the landlord onto their unit. Um, so related topics um, that come up often. So we're going to be getting into that as well. Um, if there's any questions throughout the slide, go ahead and put it into the chat. Um, I'm not going to have too much time to read the chat while I'm going, but at the end, when we're done with everything, I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to answer as much as time allows, okay? But um, we got some ground to cover, so let's get started. All right. All right, so... In the state of California, there are two laws that govern uh, the survivor's right to change the locks. One is California Civil Code Section 1941.5. The other is 1941.6. Now, these two laws come together to form the framework of this topic that we're talking about today. One of them, uh, point five, deals with circumstances where the abuser and the survivor do not live together in the same residence. Um, they have a relationship, however, they are living in different residences. Um, point six deals with circumstances when the abuser and the survivor do, in fact, live together in the same residence. And as you can imagine, this creates a much more complicated dynamic um, and especially when we get into circumstances where maybe the abuser is the one who has their name on the lease and the survivor uh, does not have their name on the lease. So uh, complicated situations that we'll be discussing um, as we get deeper into the topic, okay? So we'll move on to the next slide. Now, what is the overarching uh, point of these laws? Okay, so California Civil Code, uh, requires that the landlord under circumst certain circumstances have to change the exterior locks for a domestic violence survivor. Um, in instances of domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking, um, there are some requirements that have to be met first, but um, the key point is that the landlord is obligated to go ahead and change the locks um, when certain steps are met, okay? Um, so moving on to the next slide, what are the requirements? So within 24 hours after a DV survivor provides a landlord with a written request, uh, not a verbal request, a request in writing, and accompanies that written request with either a court order or a police report documenting domestic violence abuse, uh, that, that then triggers the obligation of the landlord to go ahead and change the locks. All the exterior locks of any unit have to be changed and the survivor has to be given a key after the landlord goes ahead and changes the locks, okay? So the, the law that we highlighted, the civil code, expressly provides this protection for domestic violence survivors. And uh, just note that the requirement is a written request along with a court order or a police report documenting abuse. Um, now, so the specific form needed to make the request, is there any kind of required language that's needed for the request? Uh, just know that um, depending on whether or not the domestic violence abuser and the survivor live together in the same residence, the requirements are slightly different, okay? 
Um, if the abuser and the survivor do not live together under the same residence, the only requirement that is uh, re required to get the locks change is that the request is in writing and proof of the abuse, the proof either uh, a police report or a uh, court order. If they do live together, the survivor has to provide a court order that specifically excludes the abuser from the unit. So that's an added requirement um, if the two of them live in the same residence. This court order can't be more than 180 days old. So if you have an old order from a year ago, for example, you can't then try to enforce that with the landlord. It has to be some current order within the past 180 days that specifically says that the abuser is to be excluded from that unit, okay? Um, so we're gonna be moving on to um, this example here that we've provided. This is the DV100 form. This is a standard uh, domestic violence restraining order form that many courts throughout California uses. Um, now, before, before that, just some background on restraining orders in California. Not to get too deep into the weeds here, but there are a wide variety of restraining orders. Um, there are restraining orders such as uh, elder abuse restraining orders, workplace harassment restraining orders, civil abuse restraining orders that um, govern relationships that might not be as close as a domestic violence relationship, for instance, between roommates or friends, um, things of that sort, or between a tenant and a landlord, which we'll talk about in more detail. For our purposes, uh, we're talking about a domestic violence restraining order, which is, again, a specific type of restraining order. And also, uh, to further complicate matters, uh, the venue to get these restraining orders, uh, there are multiple venues, and they can you, they it can be acquired through criminal court, through civil court, through uh, juvenile dependency court. Um, so it's going to depend on your case, how you how your case arrives at court, um, the the venue where you seek the restraining order. Um, but we'll talk a bit more about how to guide you through all of this and what the best resources are to kind of seek out to get directions about how to file one of these. Okay. But first of all, um, I wanted to highlight this particular form, DV100, which is uh, a very standard um, domestic violence restraining order. And specifically, I wanted to point out item number 13, as you can see on your screen. This is what you're looking for when you're looking for a kickout order, okay? So this is asking the judge to order an individual, the abuser, to be removed from the residence. Um, keep in mind, remember that that was one of the requirements for when the abuser and the survivor lived together under the same roof, okay? So you're gonna need this particular item on the restraining order to be filled out and signed by the judge, okay? So um, that is the one item I wanted to highlight. Also, item number 17 ties into that. It's asking the judge to give the survivor use and possession and control of the property once the um, the abuser is removed from the residence. Okay, this is especially relevant in circumstances where the abuser might be the only person with their name on the lease and the survivor is not mentioned. Um, so this particular item, item number 17, is going to be very relevant. So what happens after you receive a restraining order? How do you go ahead and how do you enforce that? Um, now, the easiest way is for the sheriff to serve the order onto the abuser um, as soon as you obtain it. And they can let the abuser know that they have to move out of the premises immediately. Um, the police can also be called to enforce a move out order once the abuser receives a copy of it, once they're served with a copy. Um, another option is requesting uh, that the police accompany you for when you go and serve the order and try to enforce the kickout orders. So that way you're protected uh, from the abuser and uh, you can have protection when they gather their personal belongings and vacate the premises. Um, 
So those are all options for how to enforce the order once you receive it. Um, so can you also get the permission from the court to change your locks for circumstances that don't necessarily involve domestic violence? For instance, in, um, circumstances of harassment, uh, threatening conduct, things of that nature uh, that don't necessarily deal specifically with domestic violence? And the answer to that is yes, California law does provide protections, specifically the civil code um, at the bottom of that screen that you can see is California Civil Code Section 1941.5 D and F. Um, a court order can be issued by the court to protect someone against threats and harassment, even if they don't involve specifically domestic violence, okay? Now, what happens if the landlord receives a request from a domestic violence survivor and they receive the proper paperwork uh, from the survivor and they just decide not to go ahead and change the locks within the 24 hours? Unfortunately, this is a circuit, this is a specific um, this is a circumstance that happens a lot. Um, it's one thing to get a court order. It's another to have someone else enforce it. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of clients where the landlord is just negligent, uh, slow on the draw. They're just dragging their feet. They don't want to get involved. They're very leery of court orders. And sometimes they just don't want to act. Okay, so what happens in those circumstances? If the landlord doesn't want to change the locks after you have requested it, then the survivor can go ahead and change the locks themselves without the landlord's permission. And they have the protection of California law to go ahead and do this, okay? So there's some requirements. Uh, the survivor has to inform the landlord of the changing of the locks within 24 hours, and the survivor has to provide the landlord with a copy of the key, okay? There's some other requirements as well. Uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Basically, the locks have to be of similar or better quality than the old locks, okay? So that means that um, the replacement locks have to be as secure as the original lock that you're changing, um, preferably even in an improved model. And this is because the landlord is responsible for the security and safety of the unit. Um, and when the tenant goes ahead and changes the locks for them, uh, this is kind of upholding that obligation that the landlord has, okay? Um, and also to note, um, the locks have to be done in a workmanlike manner. So. Uh, you know, if you're not quite handy and you want to bust out the toolkit on the weekend to see if you can get the locks changed yourself, I would advise you to get a professional. If you don't think you can do it in a professional manner, it has to be done in a way that is satisfactory, okay, in a workmanlike manner. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So what happens uh, if the lease that was signed between the survivor and the landlord specifically states that the tenant cannot change the locks, okay? Um, we see this often as well um, in our practice. Landlords are not lawyers most of the time. They're laypersons or small mom and pop owners, um, and they feel that if they put something in a lease, then it must be binding if both parties sign off on it. That's not the case. Um, what is stated on a lease cannot violate uh, California state law, okay? So the survivor absolutely can change the locks even if the lease prohibits it. Um, and they, as long as they meet those requirements, provide written notice as well as paperwork backing them up, uh, either a restraining order or a police report, they have the right protected by California law to go ahead and change the locks. Okay, even if the lease says they can't. Um, now, here we're getting into some more complicated fact patterns. What if the abuser and the survivor are both listed on the lease? Remember that we're dealing with domestic violence relationships. These are often very personal, messy relationships, dealing with you know spouses, often family members. So um, what happens if they share a residence and they're both on the lease? The survivor can still ask the landlord to change the locks, okay? Now, 
the caveat to that is before you ask, you need a court order that excludes the abuser from the home. Um, also called the move out order or the kick out order. We previously went over this in the slides um, that highlighted those items on the DV form. Um, that's what you wanna make sure the court signs off on uh, in order for you to be able to enforce the kicking out of an abuser who is on the lease, okay? Um, Now, um, we talked a bit at the beginning about how convoluted and complicated sometimes navigating um, the, the whole process of a restraining order, how there's many, many types of restraining orders, various venues and courts where you can apply for these restraining orders. Um, not to get too much into the weeds here, because that's kind of outside the scope of what we're trying to talk about today, but I wanted to give you guys some touchstones about where you can seek help and guidance. Um, your best resources are gonna be any local legal aid society that deals with the issue of domestic violence. Um, most of them have attorneys or staff members who uh, have the knowledge of the local courts and can help you um, either apply for the restraining order or at least give you some guidance on how you can go about doing that yourself. Um, there's also free clinics at many of the courthouses that can assist you with filing a restraining order. Um, a lot of self-help centers also do this at the courthouse. Um, our organization, HERA, uh, we have contacts with organizations that we can refer for any survivors that want assistance with obtaining restraining orders. So those are all the types of resources that you want to look for in your local area and they're gonna have the best knowledge of how to go about this for your local court, uh, the procedures that they use, the any specific forms, um, and they can give you the best type of advice for your circumstances, okay? So um, it it is kind of uh, a much more complicated process than we would like, but with proper guidance, anyone can kind of find the help that they need for their area. Um, Again, this next slide just kind of reiterates what I've already talked about. Many different types of restraining orders, depending on the type of case, they have specific requirements, procedures, contact your legal aid clinic, your self-help desk. Um, there's a link on this page that is the California Courts Self-Help Guide that can uh, direct you towards some of these clinics and resources. Now, uh, the next topic is going to be whether or not a DV survivor can obtain assistance paying for the rent uh, once an abuser moves out of the residence. Um, keep in mind, again, we're dealing with a lot of family units, sometimes uh, disputes between spouses, so finances are definitely tied into all of this. Um, now, what happens if a survivor obtains a move out order for that abuser, but they find themselves in a circumstance where once that person moves out, they can't afford the rent payments on their own? Um, well, the survivor can go ahead and they can ask the court to order the abuser to pay uh, the rent or the mortgage or any other liens. Um, and again, this request is going to be stated on the restraining order, um, and you want the judge to go ahead and sign that. Um, be sure to be prepared to explain to the court why it's important um, that the financial situation, um, why you need help for the situation you're in. Um, for instance, you can explain that the abuser is the sole source of income for your household and that you could be facing possible eviction or homelessness if they just move out of the residence and stop paying. Um, so that is also one of the protections that the survivor has in order to make sure that they're not also being punished when the abuser has to move out of that residence. And um, this is the specific section that we just referred to, um, item number 22 on the DV100 form. This is going to be the area where you're going to list out the details, the financial details for the court and you're gonna be requesting uh, that the court order the abuser to pay the rent or the mortgage or whatever liens are attached to the property. Here are um, a couple of slides that I have included 
Um, these are going to list grants that can possibly provide financial assistance for victims of domestic violence. Um, for instance, the California's Victims of the Crime of Crime Program. This is one of the grants that can go ahead and um, provide financial assistance. Uh, the next one we have is the California Victim Compensation Board. Um, they can also provide assistance um, in terms of uh, dealing with these situations. And the third one I have on here is the California Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay. Um, and also one of the common circumstances that comes up that I wanted to address is what happens if the landlord wants to abuse, uh, wants to evict the domestic violence survivor based on a domestic violence incident that has occurred uh, at the property. Um, a lot of times, like I said, landlords, they don't want to be involved in these types of legal situations or disputes, especially if it involves the police. A lot of landlords get very leery about that. Um, and they might be looking for reasons to evict the survivor, okay? Um, in California, that is not allowed. A landlord cannot legally evict a tenant solely because they're a victim of domestic violence. Now, the caveat, that, caveat to that is you can be evicted for other reasons, okay? Uh, you can be evicted still if you for instance, don't pay rent or you damage the property um, or you violate any of the other uh, clauses on the lease, those can still be valid grounds for you to be evicted. Um, but what the law does provide protection for is you, they can't kick you out simply because you're a survivor of domestic violence. Um, you are a protected class under the law. Um, and um, so in the housing context, the Violence Against Women Act, as well as the California Civil Code, offers protection to those, uh, to members of that protected class. Um, another form of protection that survivors have. Uh, survivors cannot be evicted or penalized for calling the police or emergency assistance. Um, any local ordinances that seek to penalize a survivor uh, for calling the police or any kind of emergency assistance, California law specifically supersedes that, okay? So a lot of clients that come to us, they feel like they're faced with a very impossible choice. Uh, do I speak out against my abuser and try to get out of this situation, or am I going to really rock the boat um, in, in my housing situation and possibly be faced with an eviction? You don't have to choose, okay? The law protects you so that you don't have to choose between those uh, outcomes. You can get the protection you need and also have the protection to stay in your residence. Um, and that is, again, the code for that is listed at the top of the slide um, if anyone wants to do further research. What happens if you want to terminate your lease early after an abuse happens? If you want to just simply leave the residence, for instance, if the abuser knows where you live, if they've lived in that residence with you before and they know exactly where you're staying, oftentimes survivors feel much more comfortable moving to a different place. Um, a tenant who obtains a restraining order um, or any other written proof of uh, written court order or document against an abuser, they have the right to terminate their lease early without any sort of penalties. Um, again, the requirements are a written notice to the landlord, and you want to go ahead and provide a copy of the court order as proof, um, but there won't be any penalties for relocating. Um, once the landlord receives a notice that you want to leave the residence and terminate your lease early, um, they, so you can terminate and leave within 30 days. Um, just keep in mind though, as uh, as the tenant, um, you are still responsible for any rent or charges that accrues within that 30 day notice period. Um, and the, the caveat to that would be if the landlord is able to re-rent those premises before then. Um, and, you're still, just keep that in mind, you're still obligated to pay the rent for those 30 days um, and you are still obligated to pay any charges that occurs. 
Okay. So, and this is a really tricky situation that's uh, we're going to talk about next. What if the abuser is on the lease, but I'm not? Um, this happens again, unfortunately, uh, more often than we would like to see. Um, one spouse might be, you know, the the person whose name is on the lease. The other person who we're seeking to protect is not. Um, now you can still go ahead and obtain a move out order for the abuser. Okay, even if you're not on the lease. Um, you have a right under the color of the law to use that property, and the court may still grant you a move-out order no matter whose name is on the lease. Now, what do we mean by right under the color of the law? Okay, um, let's move on to that next slide. Now, the right under the color of the law can be interpreted um, in different ways, um, and the court is going to be looking at several factors, okay, um, to see who has a right under the color of the law to use the property. Uh, for instance, they're going to see who's been living at the property, um, who's been helping to pay part of the rent, um, whether or not the survivor has been contributing to the household in non-monetary methods, such as cleaning or buying food for the household or maintaining, upkeeping the household. Um, all of that you want to include in the domestic violence restraining order request form that you're going to be filling out. You're going to want to provide details. Um, and essentially, you're going to be wanting to show the judge that you have a right to live in that residence, that you've been, um, under the color of the law, a tenant at that residence, okay? So the next slide again, reiterating, attaching proof, details on your TRO request, explaining your housing situation, okay? Um, things that could help you back up your claims. Uh, for instance, receipts showing that you're paying part of the rent, uh, any screenshots of uh, money transfers that go towards rent, any utility bills in your name, um, or if you're receiving mail at that address. Um, ultimately, it's going to be up to the judge to make a call on whether or not um, you can be considered a tenant and these rights can be extended to you. But just remember that all of these factors are going to help prove your case, okay? Now, we're going to move on to a different topic um, that doesn't really deal with domestic violence. However, it is a topic that comes up quite a lot, in my experience, um, when it comes to um, the types of clients we receive in the housing and tenant unit. Okay, so this, this circumstance happens enough times where I feel like it should be included in this slide, um, and it deals tangentially with what we've been talking about, okay? And that situation is, what if the landlord is harassing me? Uh, what are my rights in that circumstance, okay? Um, now, off the top of my head, the when it comes to landlord harassment, uh, we're not necessarily talking about a domestic violence restraining order that would be uh, the document that uh, is involved in this situation. We're talking more about um, a civil restraining order, okay? Um, but again, contact your local clinic, your legal aid uh, associations. They can help provide you with a direction for where you want to go with this. Um, it can be criminal if the landlord was arrested, if the police are involved, but um, just in case it's not, it, it would likely be a civil restraining order. Um, now, under California law, landlord harassment is illegal, okay? Now, harassment, um, that's when a landlord uses aggressive methods to either uh, coerce or intimidate a client or to try to fraudulently trick them into doing what the landlord wants, okay? Um, the most common incidence is if a landlord forcibly tries to pressure a tenant to leave the unit, either by threats or menacing conduct. Um, this is covered under California Civil Code 1940.2, um, which states that this type of behavior is illegal in California. Okay, now, landlords who are found to have been guilty of um, harassment of their tenants, they can be liable for punitive damages of up to $2,000 for every violation of this law. Um, and a tenant, in order to receive this payment of damages, they don't 
actually have to be evicted yet um, or face constructive eviction, um, they can still go ahead and seek these damages for harassment even before then. Um, also, uh, tenants can receive protection from anti-retaliation statute. That's California Civil Code 1942.5. This prevents a landlord from harassing a tenant after the tenant has asserted their rights under the law. Okay, um, So they're not allowed to come back and retaliate against you further if you accuse them of harassment and try to seek damages. Now, that's what the law says. That is what the law of California provides in terms of protection against the landlord harassment. Um, however, uh, I want to hit home this point, and that is that um, logistically, it is a much more different and much more difficult case to try to prove landlord harassment, okay? Landlord harassment, um, and I'll get into the slides later, but landlords have certain rights when it comes to entering the premises, inspecting the premises, doing repairs, and often their harassing behavior, they can construe that as we're just here to do uh, legally allowed inspections, we're here to do repairs, we're not uh, there to harass anyone. So they can use that guise of legitimacy to kind of mask what they're trying to do, okay? So um, this is, and this brings us to the next point. These types of cases involving landlord harassment, it often comes down to um, whether or not a tenant has the ability to prove the harassment, okay? Um, this is very important. Tenants have to be very diligent in documenting all the incidents of harassment. Um, tenants should be keeping up a log with dates and times of all these incidents that occur. Um, if possible, get things in writing. Um, if there's communications between you and the landlord through voice, email or text where they're being very threatening or coercive, um, that counts as evidence that you can gather. Um, try to take pictures or recordings if you can. Um, also, keep in mind that if a tenant feels that they're in physical danger, they can still seek um, help from the police and they can pursue a restraining order against their landlord. Um, so, the most common incident of landlord harassment that we see is a landlord's um, attempt to enter the property without prior notice. So California law allows a landlord to enter pre uh, the premises of a residence without advance notice in a few circumstances. Um, one is an emergency occurs that allows a landlord to go inside the home. For instance, it's the most common fire. If they see a fire going off in the residence, they have the right to enter the home because it's an emergency. Um, if they obtain uh, the tenant's consent, they can go in without prior advance notice. If the tenant has abandoned the property, um, they can go in. This requires uh, more of a showing on their part, on their part to, to prove that the property has been abandoned. For instance, they'll they can bring out in court um, that they had a reasonable belief that the property was abandoned. If mail has been piling up at this property for two years, no one's coming to collect. If no one has seen the tenant in years, if rent has, hasn't been coming through for a long period of time, these are all signs that can, that can uh, push a landlord towards a reasonable belief that the property has been abandoned. Um, also, if neighbors have seen the tenant move out of the residence, that can also count. Um, and the last incident would be um, a landlord gets a court order that allows them to enter the premises. In that case, they can go in without advance notice. Now, in most other circumstances, California allows a landlord to enter the premises only if they provide advance written notice. Um, and here are the most common circumstances for that. If they make um, to make agreed upon or necessary repairs, improvements, or alterations to the property. Um, and notice that we highlighted agreed upon and necessary repairs, okay? Um, the tenant has the opportunity to argue if something is agreed upon, if something is necessary. 
However, keep in mind that tenants cannot really bar a landlord from entering the premises if they have a reasonable um, if they have a reasonable purpose, such as making repairs to the property. Um, another another reason why they can enter the property with advance notice if they're showing the premises to contractors or workers, if they're showing the property to lenders, um, if they're touring the place with prospective buyers or any other tenants. Um, conducting any kind of pre-move out inspection to check for damages when it comes to returning attendance deposits. These are all valid reasons where uh, with advance written notice, they can go ahead and enter the premises. Um, they cannot, however, just enter a premises without any type of legal basis. If they just say, we're going to come in um, without giving a legally valid reason, that's not sufficient under the law. Okay, so that is um, that's where the line is drawn. Again, this next slide kind of points out to what I was mentioning earlier. Um, tenants cannot unreasonably deny a landlord entry into the apartment. Um, so they, if a tenant unreasonably refuses to give the landlord access, the landlord can use this as grounds to attempt to evict the, the tenant, um, then if the tenant's refusal is based on uh, time and date being inconvenient, then the tenant can request a different time that's workable for them. Um, however, if the landlord has a valid legal reason for entering the premises, the tenant cannot simply unilaterally just say no across the board, okay? They need to have a legal purpose, but once they do have that they are allowed on the premises with advance notice. Now, what is advance notice? Um, the law is not quite clear cut on this. However, most experts uh, of California law believe that 24 hours, that's kind of the guideline that most people use, that most landlords use. 24 hours is uh, the most commonly used uh, advance notice period. Um, the written notice of entry has to give the time and the date um, that the landlord is intending to enter the home, um, and that is also another requirement. And what is proper written notice? Okay, proper written notice is usually personally given to the tenant, or it can be dropped off at a normal entry to the premises, like your doorway, or your mailbox so that a reasonable person might discover it. Um, it can be left with a person of suitable age or discretion at the premises. Um, and if the landlord mails a written entry notice to the tenant's last known address, it's going to require that the postmark states that at least six days have, uh, that the tenant gets at least six days notice before the entry date. Um, and the entry has to occur within normal business hours. That's Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. Um, of course, that can be deviated if the tenant and landlord agree on a different time, but standard operating procedure is business hours. So next, we're going to talk about the abuse of the right to entry. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Harassment cases against landlords are notoriously hard to prove because most of the time harassment is cloaked under the legitimate guise of the landlord exercising their right to enter the premises for those legally allowed reasons. Uh, inspections uh, showing the place for other tenants, um, lenders, et cetera, that we discussed. Now, where the abuse occurs, um, this, so when they cross the line, keep a note of these types of behaviors, um, harassment or encouraging a tenant to leave before the lease expires, um, sending any of their agents to the property multiple times or excessively um, for trumped up reasons, this can amount to harassment, even if uh, they give advance notice. Um, if they make too many calls to the tenant asking for permission, essentially badgering them to allow be allowed entry, that can be considered harassment. Um, also, definitely entering a property without proper notice, cause, or permission. Um, 
And all of these types of abusive behaviors, remember, they can be penalized with a $2,000 fine um, under California law. Um, and also remember that if um, the, uh, a landlord's harassment can reach the level of criminal trespass, um, which can subject them to abuse if they go too excessive with their behavior as well and the police get involved. And another way, um, so another way that, um, so another way that landlords commonly use harassment is the threat of eviction or going ahead and filing for eviction. Um, a local legal aid organizations like HERA can help. Um, other legal aid offices near you can also help. There's links that I've provided in this next uh, slide. Private attorneys, you can seek referrals from the California State Bar. Um, and you can also consult um, the California Courts self-help resources for tenants. Um, and that website is linked down below as well. And I wanted to kind of close on this last slide because um, it's very important, not just to the topics that we're talking about, domestic violence, landlord harassment, but I would also argue that this could be added to almost any training involving the law, okay? And that is the importance of documentation. Um, this is a point that we touched on throughout the slide, but I wanted to leave you with this last point. Um, and the reason for that there are several, okay? Um, when you're dealing with the legal system, keep in mind judges, lawyers, police officers, anyone dealing with the legal system, they are not omnipotent. They are not all-knowing. Uh, they don't have any kind of sixth sense that, that can read people's minds. Um, what they look at often is tangible evidence, okay? And what that is specifically we're talking about is documentation. So the best way for any client to protect their rights, the best way for any domestic violence abuser to protect themselves is to document as much as possible um, the types of behaviors that you're seeking relief from. Um, written logs are great. Document um, uh, any witness statements. Um, keep as much interaction as you can over writing via email or text. Uh, because other than that, you're gonna be coming to court and a lot of circumstances end up being a he said, she said between two different parties and the judge without evidence isn't going to know which side they're gonna lean on, okay? Um, so again, at the bottom of this slide, um, some examples of evidence that you want to be uh, keeping in mind, pictures, videos of any rental units, receipts from extent, uh, expenses, texts and emails with the landlord, um, any inspection reports, um, and those you want to keep a log on, you want to keep organized, and that is going to help assist you in, in any future legal situation you find yourself in, okay? Um, and finally, um, we have here a slide for um, contacting our organization if you need any help. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. I'll, I'll review it. If there's no questions, um, if you or if you have any kind of very specific in-depth questions, you can reach us at the phone number that I've just provided here. Um, also, um, under the email address, inquiries at harrisca.org. So I'll just check very quickly if there's any questions in the chat. And if not we can go ahead and we can adjourn in a few minutes, okay? Thank you guys so much for uh, participating.